All right, hey everybody, welcome back to PBS Books coverage of the Miami Book Fair 2018. I'm sitting right now with Tommy Orange, who is the author of There There, a National Book Award, uh, fine, or I'm sorry, National Book Award long-listed book this year. Congratulations on Thank that. You. So nice to have you here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so we were just talking uh, off camera about the fact that your book came out in about four or five months ago. And it's just been this blazing fire of interest since it came out. There's so many great things being written and talked about this book. Uh, but I thought we'd start with the discussion of the Native American experience and urbanity. There's a section of your prologue called Urbanity that I dove into and was really interested because it was it's just a different look at the Native American experience than I think a lot of people see. And, uh, and obviously, it's a, it's a part of life you know pretty well, coming from that area of the country. But if you could tell us a little bit about sort of how that inspired you and the, and the thought process behind the urban and the urban native idea. So I worked in the urban native community in Oakland for about almost a decade. Um, and I grew up in, in Oakland. And um, so I didn't see it represented in, in books or in movies. And often you see this sort of one version of what native people are and it's historical or it's reservation. And, um, and I just know a much more dynamic world. And so I, I just wanted to represent where I come from, who I come from, that's Oakland um, and being native. And there's a particular experience that Native American people growing up in the city have. And, um, you know, a lot of people think of a sort of return to the land or um, connection to the earth yeah, or the all natural these. world. You and, know. you know, it's it's not not true in certain worldviews, but there's 500 over 576 tribes with all with different worldviews and relationships to um, to the world and to the earth. Um, the urban one is just. Uh, you know, it's, it's how we relate to our environment growing up in the city. And so I just wanted to represent that in the book um, and sort of give con context. You know, in, in the 1950s, uh, there's something called relocation. And so a lot of Native people moved from reservations to, to the cities for jobs or for, um, after the war. Um, there was actually like an active program put on by the U.S. government to, to sort of dissolve tribes and assimilate and sort of make Native people disappear. It's, you know, kill the Indian, save the man sort of campaign that was going on then. So people started up Indian centers in all the major cities and a lot of tribes just ended up at those community centers and started families. And now we're like three or four generations in to native people, you know, having a relationship to the cities that they live in. Yeah. It's interesting that the idea of the city is maybe the, um, sort of the last step of assimilation, uh, where, you know, sort of dissolve, as you said, you know, sort of the, the tribal elements of native American culture, but it, it hasn't at all. In fact, it's only created a new offshoot of it. And it just seems like a really interesting one at that. Yeah. It's a thriving community and also a struggling one. I mean, native American health statistics are, um, tough to look at because it's the disparity is just major. Um, but there's, you know, there's, it's a complex and dynamic group of people who are doing a lot of cool things in the art world and um, a lot of good community work too. Well, at the center of your book is the Big Oakland Pow Wow, which is this gathering, uh, and there's 12 different storylines that there are sort of interconnected stories, like novellas that all come together at the Big Oakland Pow Wow. But each one of these chapters, as it were, each one of these characters has their own chapter, and, and you dive into a different dynamic with each one. And it's 12 very different people, some of them young, some of them older, some of them struggling in one way or the other, others kind of you know, excited about being at this event, and, and all different when you were thinking about the 12 personas that you wanted to put together, I mean, first of all, why 12? And I mean, it seems like a lot of work to write in the sort of voice of 12 different folks, but, but where did you sort of draw the lines on where you wanted to go? And did you know the sort of areas that you wanted to hit as you put that together? It definitely was not as organized as you made it sound. Yeah, it experience. sounds like it was, yeah. Uh, you know, the first year I was writing it, this is beginning of 2012, um, I was just like, furiously writing. I had a full-time job, but I woke up, just had a son. He was about a year old. Wake up five in the morning and write for three hours before work and would write at night after my son went to sleep. And I was just sort of auditioning a wide cast of characters to see what would stick, what felt compelling, what, what had legs, what felt real and true. Um, so there, there's, there was many more than 12 who, over the six year um, who got cut. Uh, they're out there somewhere, though. Yeah, they're they're in a messy folder that has <laughs> about a thousand folders in it. Um, so I, I just sort of through the six year process, just try to figure out what what stories um, what, what stories would stick and which ones sort of automatically connected. They, they just had a way of organically coming together in my 
in my head, but it was mess. It was a messy process. And uh, even when it got to the editor, I had 15. So it, it was down to 12 at the you last. You had to leave some people off. It's like the last people getting cut off the sports team. You know, yeah. At the very, very end. That's, that's yeah, painful. Yeah, you know, I love, I love what working with the editor and what it, it became, you know, with the editor. I'm, I'm happy with what happened. Yeah, you talked about earlier you have a seven-year-old son. When you said just now that you were working and he was one at the time. So there's a six-year process of writing this book. Can you talk about being a debut writer? Just what propelled you as you're going through those six years, knowing on the other end there might be something, maybe not. You didn't know what you had yet. There wasn't even any expectations yet on you until that agent came later. But that process of writing something, not knowing what was there, what, what, you, what you could give to the world yet. You know, in some ways, the book is this exact same age as my son or close to it. Um, I thought of the idea for the book seven years ago. Um, it was right after I found out I was going to be a dad. Um, and the idea just popped into my head. I'd been working in the native community for many years and I'd known, I'd been writing for many years. Um, and I know that I wanted to, I knew I wanted to write a, a novel and, um, the idea popped in my head, the whole thing, like to have a whole bunch of characters come together and how their lives converge at a, at a Oakland powwow at the Coliseum was the basic idea that I wrote into, but I didn't start writing it after I thought of it, uh, cause I was just becoming a dad and that's, you know, it's consuming. Um, so it was a year after I got the idea that I sort of went at it really hard and, um, yeah, it, I was convinced of that. I could do it, that I could write the novel. It's there ambitious. were certainly moments where I, I didn't think I'd pull it off. I was convinced enough to keep working on it. Um, and you know, I still had to work. Um, so it wasn't like everyone was depending on something happening with the book, right. you know, it, for six Sometimes. years, you're telling people you're working on a novel, and they're like, yeah, how's that novel going? Uh, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Not anymore, man. It's yeah. happening for you. Um, I, I'm curious, as, as, as some of the characters, as I read through them, I mean, there's a, there's a character, uh, Bill Davis, who talks about some of the writing. He was, in, he was in prison for a while, and he talked about how prison was actually a place where he read a ton. And you talk about Hunter S. Thompson, and you talk about uh, Raymond Carver, and, and Faulkner, and, and Hemingway, and Ken Kesey. And... And as you were thinking about these characters, do you project, I mean, some of your own like little elements into them, the things that you like as well? And do you, do you drop these Easter eggs in there to some of these characters and were there others in there that you just were really exploring people completely different from yourself? You know, some people have asked, like, do I, have I based these characters on real people? And uh, I, I always tell them that they're much more me than anybody else. So I definitely try to infuse them with real details from me that, um, feel distinct enough from me that it doesn't sound like I'm just doing myself over and over through the characters. Um, but I definitely do a lot of research also to try to make the characters feel real. So uh, the, the writing, the character will sort of inform my research and then the researcher will inform the character and it's sort of a feedback loop that I try to build into something real. But you have to be perceptive too and you're just seeing things out there and you're just paying attention and you're noticing little ticks and interesting elements of human beings that you run across, I'm sure too. I think so. I think writers and uh, have a way of synthesizing or making composites of a collection of humans into, into real feeling people. Yeah. What was your, when you were being raised uh, in, in a native household, um, what was it like for you? And, and did you talk about it much? What was the culture like for you when you were growing up? Well, I was, my dad's native and he's Cheyenne. He's from Oklahoma. My mom's white from Oakland. So it was definitely like a biracial experience. Um, both things were going on. My dad spoke Cheyenne. He didn't teach us. He spoke Cheyenne too. Yeah, he's fluent. Yeah. Um, it was his first language. Um, but he didn't teach us because the times were different. The, the, our generation was a little more of one of assimilation. Many before that too. And if you don't have both parents in the household t speaking the language to each other, it's much harder. And sometimes it's a privilege to be able to teach those things. If he's wor He worked full time, worked hard and came home and we ate dinner and he would pray for 20 minutes and you know, then we might watch TV and do homework and go to bed. So there's not much room for, uh, we would go back to Oklahoma and visit our relatives and we always knew who we are. And, um, you know, he would tell us stories and stuff like that. It wasn't until I got into working in the native community in Oakland that I felt like I was part of a community and something distinct, hmm. which is the urban native experience. Um, but sort of knowing, I, I always knew what I came from, what I, what I am. He made sure and, and, you know, told us what we are and, so, but it was a biracial household and um, that that's its own experience at the same time. But there seems to be like an interest in identity uh, and a discussion of origins and identity and, and 
this generation, your generation and younger, it seems really much more interested in diving deeper into that than, than maybe your parents were, for instance. Why do you think that is? Well, I don't know. My dad definitely was. He, he became an engineer. He worked at the Lawrence Berkeley Labs, but he also he minored in um, Native American studies. He, his plan was to go back to the reservation and kind of bring the skills he got from school um, to, the, to his tribe, and things didn't work out that way. Um, with my mom, you know, with white culture, sometimes it's hard to explore because you could be like, she, we're probably like eight different things from oh, eight yeah. different countries. And um, American, you know, history, not, not everybody wants to embrace what that is. And she was kind of a, a wild hippie. Um, but yeah, this generation is more interested in identity. And I think it's a, an interesting time to do that because you have people with biracial experience. You have a president who is biracial. You have people that are four different things. And trying to figure out what that means, I think you don't want it, you don't want things to be lost to, to history and just become kind of a, um, I don't know, just a, a sort of blah. Uh, so I think that you struggle against having essential parts of you disappear and you don't want that to happen. So trying to find a way, you have to dig deeper to try to find ways to find things that are real, that feel real to you, that are a part of you and sort of honor them. You yeah. know what I mean? You know, there's a big, uh, there's a, a Jackie Redfeather uh, character in your book who, um, has addiction problems. And that's something that a lot of people think about when they think about reservation life and, and Native Americans. It's something that's a, it's a stigma that's been attached to the community. It wasn't something you shied away from necessarily, but I did feel like there's a difference in it. And as you think about that as a, as a, as a legacy to some degree of the Native American experience, how did you want to address that personally and look at it so that maybe you took a different tact? Well, one way I did it was just to have one of my characters just flat out say what my position on it. Um, there's nothing special about the relationship between alcohol and natives. It's been made into that because there's been a lot of smear campaigns against native people, like we're dumb and we're drunks. And that's a convenient smear campaign if you're trying to dehumanize people. If you're doing sort of inhumane practices and policies, it's, it's convenient to think of them as subhuman. That's what the American government has been doing for a long time. Um, I have one of the characters say there's nothing special about the relationship in, between Indians and alcohol. It's that it's free it's legal and it's accessible. If there was something else, that would be that. And there's, you know, there's crystal meth has kind of taken over as that in our communities. And um, other communities who have been oppressed have alcohol problems too. There's nothing, there's nothing special about it. It's like mm -hmm. if you're in pain and you, you have like systematic problems that are oppressing you, there's an easy go-to to, to yeah. sort of cope with it. And there's not much more to it. It's not, it's, you know, it's not like some, like some people think like there's an enzyme missing or like there's all these theories that try to justify the, the smear campaign that's been, around for a long time. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the oppressed communities, uh, there's money to be made in some of those. These people are, are reacting to their environment, obviously, and so someone will put a store, you know, liquor store where they can sell That's the liquor in their neighborhood. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's, it, it, it's, it's by design, obviously. Yeah. Um, you know, as you've uh, gone through the, this uh, discussion and you're talking to people, this, this sort of experience of eye-opening, a different sort of vantage point of the Native American universe inside of America. It isn't a reservation. It isn't just out in the forest. And uh, that, that's that been something that I'm sure a lot of people have been curious about. And most people who aren't familiar with the Native American experience were probably raised in schools where they were taught that, that you know, that they were like the things they saw on television. There's this, this thing that's reinforced over and over again about bad, you know, Native Americans bad. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously there's also something on the other side now where people are starting to question people like Christopher Columbus and other things like that. You're part of this new movement, this sort of eye-opening thing. What are you seeing as someone who's been living in that world? Are you sensing any change or any difference or any sort of you know, American experience that's opening their eyes to, uh, to the Native American experience? I think there's, I don't know if there's any Native American specific change yet. I think, I think we're at a good place of like um, the, a beginning phase of acknowledgement. I think there is, um, some people try to ask quickly for like, well, what's the solution? And, and I think acknowledgement is the beginning part because that was never done. It was always acceptance of the lie. Um, so acknowledging that what we've been taught and sort of trying to learn what actually has been happening and what's going on is the beginning of change. And I think parallel to a lot of the stuff that Trump and people like him represent, I think there's another um, wave of new wave of people that are, are rethinking American history and um, current policy and how we view other people and equality. And uh, I think it's part of a bigger movement happening at, 
hopefully will not be uh, destroyed by a tyrant and his many cronies. Um, but right now it's not looking very good. Yeah, we'll see how things uh, unfold in the next couple of years, obviously. Um, you, this was a debut for you. Um, it, it, you've been on this ride for a little while now. Uh, you wrote, you spent six, seven years writing this book. Now you talked to me earlier about the fact that you're sort of looking to write, that you're already thinking about the next book and you're already working on the next book. Uh, do, how do you stay on the schedule now that there's this expectation? We all know who you are now, so we're wondering what you're doing next. So you get people like me asking you what you're doing next. It means moving in a different pace, obviously. It has an agent and a publisher and all these other expectations. How has that been for you? Um, you know, I, I'm just I'm doing better if I'm writing, if I have something to work on, if I have a project. As soon as I handed this in to my agent at the end of 2016, um, I went through about 10 days of like despair because I was so used to being involved with characters and a story and it's all family figuring and out the, yeah. how they all work together and uh, trying to get to the end. Um, and another novel came out of that 10-day despair period. Um, so really? Right in that 10 days? Yeah. I mean, I didn't write it in 10 yeah, days. Yeah, but no, uh, but you, the you idea felt like came, it, something was born. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, it, it's an autobiographical novel that kind of is told through the voices of all, all of my family members. So I've asked all of them uh, if that's all right if I do something like that. And um, I'm going to be interviewing all of them and sort of getting a voice from them, a fictional voice from them, and diverting in places from our actual experience because it's fiction and that's what I like to do. Um, and I'm writing another novel that um, I don't always like to talk about because I'm I'm hard at work on it, um, but I, it's I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah, well, that's good. It's yeah. good to see you excited. And just so you know, like as as hard as it was probably for you to leave these twelve characters and the dozens of others that are in that folder of yours somewhere, um, we have them all now, and we get to like uh, get to know these people. And 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 I think you're doing some amazing things to help us all better understand the world that you know so well. And I appreciate it a ton. Thank you, Tommy Orange. So cool to meet you. Thank you. Great talking. Congratulations to you. with everything that's happening to you. Appreciate it. And for all of you watching, there's still more to come. I'm Rich Folly. You are watching PBS Books coverage of the Miami Book Fair 2018. Thanks for watching and stick around.